This is Distant Replay. It's time now for another mini-sode here on the Distant Replay podcast, and we're doing true crime again. We're kind of sticking with this theme a little bit, and we'll continue to weave it in through the podcast as we move forward. But today we're focused on Jason Williams, a former NBA player. You probably heard the story at some point. If you're around the 90s and 2000s, you definitely are aware of him. If you're a little bit younger, maybe you've maybe heard mention of this story, but never really gotten the full details. So today we're going to go through Jason Williams' story, starting with his personal life and his upbringing, uh, his, his career in the NBA, and then the shooting that happened with his limo driver in 2002. So we'll do that on this episode of Just Replay Podcast. So welcome in. Mike, uh, good to have you again. We're talking uh, true crime, and and I know this this case is an interesting one, uh, and one that really grabbed the media. I mean, immediately when it happened. Oh yeah, for sure. So you're talking about uh, Jason Williams, again, a very a notable figure of the '90s um, in the, in the biggest media market in New York, and that matters because once the tabloids get a hold of a story like this, it becomes a spectacle, and this definitely was. And again, thank you for the uh, for the feedback on the true crime episodes we've done already. If you guys like them, we'll keep doing them. Is basically uh, our game plan here. And uh, like with the previous ones, this is just to give you a primer on what happened. You know what I mean? I think we right. know the name Jason Williams. We know he got in trouble. Well, what are some of the details um, in this situation? Yeah, we won't break it down completely, but we just want to go through it and kind of give you a complete look at it from a, a higher level view and, and, and kind of give you the background in case you never heard it. So let's jump into it, Mike, and start, I guess, with this story, you know, to understand kind of how he got to that point with the guns and with his limo driver, you really have to understand his early upbringing and his personal life. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of this, this true crime stuff, you know, looking at the person's early life is important and for Jason Williams, he was born in New York. His family relocated then to South Carolina, where he spent his childhood. Something to remember about Jason Williams that we'll get to much later is he's been around guns his whole life. So there's certain, you know, there, there's people who are just around guns. It's not abnormal for there to be guns around. Jason Williams uh, grew up like that. He's witnessed his father shoot at people. He's witnessed his mother shoot at his father at one point. Jeez. So again, very, very acceptable sort of in the way he was brought up. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I think that's important to understand Jason Williams is sort of the background on his sisters. So Jason Williams had three sisters. Okay. One, one sister was attacked and beaten ve very badly by a male acquaintance of hers. Okay. She was very, very seriously injured during that beating. And I heard Jason Williams talk about this on mm -hmm. Vlad TV. It's like a very popular, uh, YouTube channel where they do interviews and there's a very good interview with Jason Williams on there. I didn't watch the entire thing because it's an hour and a half, but I did watch this part where he talked about how his sister was beaten very badly that caused her to get addicted to painkillers. Like she had, she needed to be on some sort of, of meds to deal with the pain from, from the incident that caused her to then sort of graduate, if you will, to getting addicted to heroin. And then his other sister by way of hanging out with, the sister who was beaten also becomes addicted to heroin. They both end up getting AIDS from taking drugs intravenously and end up dying from AIDS. Mm. Just like a real tragic story to hear yeah. him tell it. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to not feel bad for Jason Williams, but this is one to hear him tell these stories is, is very, very eye opening. Yeah. So that's two of the three sisters. The third sister was shot in the face and killed by her husband. And then the husband turned the gun on himself and killed himself. Wow. So you have, Jason Williams, three sisters gone in very, very tragic ways. He is a big time basketball prospect, ends up getting recruited by St. John's. Now, mid late eighties, St. John's is different than today's St. John's. That, right. that program back then was one of the top in the nation. Luke Harnaseka is still the head coach. You know, they're rolling. So I'm a big deal. He went to St. John's and while he's going to school, he's actually raising the kids of his two sisters who died from AIDS. Yeah, that's, a, that's an incredible story and, and horrible to, to listen to. But, you know, he was able to kind of manage it, it sounds like, and, and get those St. John's, as you mentioned, who was a powerhouse in the 80s. And, you know, his basketball career is kind of what carried him. And, and that was kind of the bright spot in his life was his talent in basketball. And it led him right to the NBA. Absolutely. And he was a first round pick of the Phoenix Suns in the, in the 1990 draft right before the start of the season. 
the Suns traded him to the Sixers for a future first round pick, um, which you don't see that much. Usually if these trades happen, it happens on draft night, but this happened right before the season started. His first two seasons with Philadelphia, he's just a role player playing 10, 15 minutes a game, really. He then gets traded to the New Jersey Nets. And if you know Jason Williams as an NBA player, you probably know him as a New Jersey Net because he would spend the rest of his career with the Nets, okay, playing, again, the whole decade of the 90s pretty much in the NBA. And he graduated from a role player to a starter and even got to the point where he was a an all-star in 1998. So we're talking about a guy who, you know, sort of found his role in the NBA and so much to the point where he signed a $90 million contract right before the 98-99 season. Um, yeah, crazy. So back then, <laughs> $90 million was a lot. I'd forgot right? he, that his contract was that big. Wow. Yeah, remember, if, if you haven't listened to our documentary on The Last Dance, we went through how Jace, uh, how Scottie Pippen, who was one of the 5'10 best players in the league, you know, in the mid to late 90s, was only making like, what, $6, 7000000 million a year? Yeah. Yeah, so I think he signed seven-year, twenty uh, twenty-one million dollar extension or something like that, like something crazy. So this is a big money deal for Jason Williams. Again, coming off an All-Star season. Unfortunately, though, on April first, nineteen ninety-nine, which was the strike-shortened season, he broke his right leg after colliding with Stefan Marbury, which really derailed his career. Like it was a very, very sort of gruesome leg injury. It caused him to sit out the entire ninety-nine two thousand season, and eventually. He retires because of his leg injuries in June of 2000. Jeez. I mean, you can see just the guy that was, I mean, plagued with bad luck, it sounds like, and just kind of surrounded by just a lot of negativity in his life. I mean, even with that, that you know, he signs that contract, and then to have that kind of happen, it just kind of offsets it. And, yeah, you can understand kind of maybe where he is mentally and, and why he kind of got into guns. And I think that's kind of what you have to talk about next is his history with guns. Yeah, and his history with guns is, is definitely important. So just to put a little snapshot on where Jason Williams is right now, he's one of these players that was a fan favorite because he was a really, really good rebounder. You know, one of those guys that hustles, always where he needs to be, very active, emotional. You know, he's one of those kind of players. Very good personality, so much so that when he retires, NBC, who, was, who had the NBA, you know, the national NBA package, which, you know, that ABC would have now, actually hired him as an analyst. So he goes from playing to one of those analyst roles in a very, 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 very coveted uh, position. That leads us to 2001, where he writes a book called Loose Balls. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah, just like the title would indicate. It right. was supposed to be a, a, a book of like funny stories while he was in the NBA. Okay. But in it, when you look back, it, it and this was brought up uh, uh, later on after he got into the trouble he got into, is that in the book is several stories that involve him playing with guns, including one where he almost shot Wayne Corbett on accident. Oof. Uh, that probably caught your attention. Yeah. Jets fan, Wayne Corbett almost shot. Like, I'm clicking on that article. You know how, like, <laughs> you know how articles just get written for you to click on? Right. Like, Wayne Corbett shot, I'm clicking. Yeah. So, but anyway, so this all leads up to the day in, que the day in question, February 14th, 2002. Okay. Jason Williams hires a limo driver named Costas Christafi to drive him and some of his friends to a restaurant. After they go to the restaurant and, you know, have their meal, have their drinks, they come back to Williams' mansion and he gives everyone a tour of the house. Okay. So pre pretty common. You have people who've never been to the, your house. You have a big house. You want to show it off. You give them a tour. Mm -hmm. The tour eventually enters Williams' bedroom and he shows everyone his gun collection. While showing off a 12, a 12 gauge double barrel shotgun, Williams admitted to this later that he failed to check the safety me mechanism properly. What happened was the gun fired once, hitting Christafi in the chest and killing him. Okay. So we have a situation where his friends, who I think were like a charity basketball team of some sort, Jason Williams and Gus Christ Costas, but they called him Gus, Gus shot in the chest, laying on the ground. Okay. Where Jason Williams sort of, you know, again, sometimes the cover-up is, is just as bad as the crime, as yeah. we went through last week with the Baylor basketball scandal. What we later found out from witnesses is that Williams tried to cover up his involvement by placing the gun in Christafi's hands and telling those present to lie about what happened. Okay? 
Yeah. I, um, and I remember like when that story came out, like there was a lot of question on what actually happened. And I kind of remember that like there was you, you were unsure of, of how he was shot and what had gone down because of this cover up. Exactly. And, and, and what this does, Ben, more than anything is it raises questions in the moment and down the line when this goes to trial. That if he didn't try to take all that time and cover things up, could he have saved Christophe's life? Mm-hmm. You know, that's sort of the thing in the background that does not make Jason Williams in the moment the most sympathetic figure at all, even though it sounds like from what was described that it was not intentional and it was a mistake, a very tragic mistake, but it wasn't, but a mistake. It's tough even listening to his entire kind of life uh, timeline. And, and this is just a few of the incidents that he's experienced. And I mean, it's all kind of tragic. Everything that's been around him, it seems like has kind of turned sour uh, in this even being the case. So, after the shooting happens, right, in, in 2002, the trial. And, and when you look back on this trial, the timeline of the trial is what really catches your attention because it stretched out so long. Yeah, for, for sure. So before we get to the trial in 2004, so remember the incident happened in February of 2002. Before we get to the 2004 criminal trial, in 2003, the Christoffi family won a $2 million settlement in a wrongful death civil case against Jason Williams. So we'll put that to the side. That's already happened. In the 2004 trial, he's acquitted of the more serious charge of aggravated manslaughter, but the jury is deadlocked on the less serious charge of reckless manslaughter. Look, I'm not saying that's not a serious charge, but you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. As compared to aggravated manslaughter, it was less serious. So now he's acquitted and the jury's deadlocked. So he's not convicted of any crime as of now. What eventually plays out is in 2006, the County Court of Appeals rules that he can be recharged on that reckless manslaughter charge. So again, we're like four years after the initial incident happened. Now. Yeah. And the Court of Appeals is saying he could be retried on a reckless manslaughter charge. There is delay after delay for the second trial to happen. In 2007, Williams uh, tries to get the charges thrown out. Because allegedly there was an investigator who used a racial slur when referring to Williams. The state Supreme Court basically ruled that, hey, look, the the decision for the second trial to be able to happen stands in spite of this racial slur incident happening. So the attempts to, to delay the trial anymore are not working, right? We get to 2010. In January of 2010, Jason Williams is involved in a separate DWI incident on January 5th, 2010, where he's driving in Manhattan drunk and he hits a light post. Okay. Yeah, I know. Now we're January 5th, literally on January 11th, he pleads guilty to the, a lesser charge. So remember not, he, he was going to be on trial for reckless manslaughter. He pleads guilty to a lesser charge of aggravated assault. And then in February, he's sentenced to five years with the ability to be paroled after 18 months. All right. So he serves his prison sentence in New Jersey until April of 2011. Then he was transferred to Rikers Island in New York to serve the rest of his 18 months and another eight months for that separate DWI conviction. Hmm. And then he's released from jail for good on April 13, 2012. So after basically eight years of of all these trials and delays and, and court rulings, he ends up going to jail from February of 2010 to April of 2012. So all so 10 years later essentially and only two of those were spent in, spent in jail. So that's that's yeah. some timeline. It's crazy and, and you know the biggest part of the aftermath for me which we always like to cover on here is the Christoffi family and what they had to go through for nearly a decade before he was finally convicted and put in jail. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to remember they're, they're hanging on every court ruling. They're hanging on every delay. You know, it, it, this is their, their loved one um, that was taken from them too soon. And to think of what they went through, I, I think sometimes we focus on the celebrity a lot, but we have to remember the victim's family as well. It's worth noting as well. Jason Williams does show remorse now for what happened. He's shown remorse. Every public appearance he's made that I saw when he's asked about it, he shows remorse. The question I think in everyone's mind still is how much does that mean when in the moment he tried to cover up the crime and when, you know, had these trials delayed for so long without pleading guilty? It's yeah, it's a difficult argument to make. I mean, it sounds just like, I mean, when you step back and look at the entire picture, this is just, it's been a difficult life. 
and he's been in bad situations and, you know, he made a, a bad decision here, essentially a couple of bad decisions, obviously to pull out the gun and not check the safety, but also the second bad decision, not to try to help Gus after the shooting. And he just, it just, you know, it, it compounded the, the problems and the issues that he had, but you, know, you step back and look at his entire life and you can just tell there's probably, he's probably dealt with a lot uh, internally, you know, and, and that's probably why the guns played a factor and why I got in, into that and just some kind of, some kind of outlet. I mean, I think just some kind of normalcy he, he was trying to find. And I don't know, hopefully, uh, I don't know what he's doing now. Do you have any idea? I, I don't, he, he does make, but he, do, he, I mean, he's out there. If you, if you YouTube yeah. him and Google him, you know, I, I tried to stick to ma mainly, you know, the crime and the aftermath in his early life with, the, with this episode, he's out there though. You can yeah. find plenty of interviews with him. Again, that Vlad TV interview is very eye opening. It's about an hour and a half long. Other than that, I primarily used newspaper articles from the day to sort of source this and, and get the information on the issues. Yeah, I did look up and, and he is, uh, I think he just celebrated four years of sobriety recently uh, in 2019. So maybe he's making some positive changes in his life. I hope so. Maybe he can have some peace uh, along the way because he's dealt with a lot of tragedy and, uh, and it's been, it sounds like it's been a very difficult time for him. So that's the story of Jason Williams, the former NBA player uh, involved with that shooting with his limo driver. And you know, hopefully this kind of gives you a, a summary of, of what happened and a look at his life and everything that was involved in that tragic event. So Mike, thanks for, uh, for giving us that story and taking us through it. Again, if you have any true crime ideas or feedback, we'd love to hear it. We're going to try to continue doing this along the way on the podcast. We'll also, as always, be doing games every uh, every week as well. So keep an eye out for those. Please hit subscribe on Distant Replay Podcast, but also find us online, distantreplaypodcast.com, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube. Mike, enjoyed it, man. Same here, Ben. Until next time.